Everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with a magician, an entertainer, actor, author, inventor, and something that many of you didn't know, upright bass player, Ben Gillette. Yay! Hello, hello. how are you? <laughs> Outstanding, Ben. It's so great to have a chance to chat with you. A while back, I was really, I won't say surprised because you're obviously a very busy and achieved individual. But when I saw the album, the show before the show, my first thought is, wait, Penn plays bass? How is this? And not only do you play bass, but you're a very accomplished upright player. So I was oh, like, whoa, you. this is this is amazing. Thanks so much. And so to jump on that same tale, you have a new album that's just been released are you sure you three guys know what you're doing? The question Three Stooges on... reference, of course. <laughs> the, the question is on the cover, but the reality inside is obviously you very much know what you're doing. And so I, I think a lot of us would like to know how did you get started in music and particularly on bass? Well, it's, it, it's funny. Um, I started playing electric bass badly with no practice back, you know, when I was just out of my teens. I mean, I was a, I was a drummer in high school, mm -hmm. and I played a little bit of bass, and I would play just enough to get by, you know, punk bass, and played with, uh, you know, I could say with a great deal of pride, I played with Maureen Tucker, The Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. I played with Lou Reed, not in public, but I would go over to his house and, you know, play the chords over and over again while he jammed. And uh, I played with some bands like Too Much Joy and stuff. But I, and I had my own little band. We played, we played skeptics conferences and stuff like that because I was very involved in the atheist movement, still am. But I never, never played seriously. I mean, my, my entire practice would have probably added up to a couple hundred hours, no, <laughs> nothing at all. You know, but I knew where the notes were and I could, I could play the stuff I had to play. But there was... Two things I really wanted to do as I get older, and two things I felt I was really missing in my life. One was I wanted to actually play an instrument and read music. Mm -hmm. I understood reading music, but I didn't really read music. And I wanted to learn a language and a second language. This is so weird, and I guess not on the border of appropriate because I don't know what, I'll get to that later, but we did a show called Sin City Spectacular. And it was a show we had a lot of guest stars on. It was in the 90s. And uh, I've never enjoyed touching anything. I mean, uh, when I talk to painters, you know, they talk about how they enjoy the sensual quality of the paint. Mm -hmm. And most musicians I talk to liked holding their acts, whatever it was, they just enjoyed it. And all I've ever really liked at all was a typewriter and a keyboard. I liked that a lot. If you watch the Penn and Teller show, I rarely touch any props. I'm mostly just talking. But we had to do a thing with the Smothers Brothers. And the gag was that Teller would do a thing with Dickie and I would do a thing with Tommy. Yeah. So Tommy and Smothers Brothers were my first heroes. It was an incredibly emotional thing and the only people who've ever played bass with Tommy are Dick Smothers, Jack Benny <laughs> and now me. Wow. So uh, Tommy wanted to do one of the classic routines and he said to me you know you're gonna have to play you play bass on this and you'll sing with me and he said it's only C and G you'll be able to learn it. So I went to uh, the bass player in, in our band, since he's spectacular, was a fabulous bass player, still is, named uh, Murray Loudon. You might know Murray Loudon. And so I got to learn this on Upright. And uh, Murray, of course, to teach a guy who already plays electric plays, bass to play C and G in an Upright was not much. But I had an incredible kind of epiphany. <laughs> When I held Dick's mother's bass, it was Dick's mother's bass I was actually playing, yeah. and just played the first note, 
I just had a, uh, an affinity that I'd never had before. It was not like the electric at all. It was so kind of brutal and raw mm-hmm. and painful and went through your whole body because you're not hearing it through the amp. You're feeling it through Indeed. your chest. And you have, I mean, there's no place a bass sounds better than playing it, which is, <laughs> which is probably not the best thing for commercial potential, but there yeah. you go. So it was an incredibly emotional and powerful experience to play with Tommy's mothers, play the bass for the mm-hmm. first time, do comedy with Tommy, set him up, play the bass, sing with Tom. It was incredible. And about two months later, our musical director was a good friend of mine, called me and said, there's a guy selling an upright bass. It's a K bass. Okay. It's uh, plywood. It was, I forget what it was. It was under a thousand or maybe a thousand dollars. And Gary said to me, which I thought was great, he said, if you buy this upright bass, the chances you'll learn to play it are almost zero. <laughs> if you don't buy this bass, the chances actually are zero. <laughs> so it's like buying your first lottery ticket. Yeah. So I bought this K cutaway rockaby bass, and I did what you're supposed to do, which is I put it in my closet. <laughs> and then, this is the part that gets so odd. My mom died, and uh, right in 2000, first day of 2000, And I was and am a real mama's boy. I was very close to my mom. I Mm -hmm. talked to her every day of my life. And I I don't, I can't make this psychological connection. But right when my mom died, I had this astonishing urge to start to learn something that I knew I couldn't be the best at. When I started juggling, when I started comedy, when I started writing, when I started doing magic, it would turn out I wouldn't be the best at them. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know it the day I started. At the instant I picked up a bass at, you know, 45 years old. Mm-hmm. At 45 years old, you pick up a bass, upright bass, you know you're not going to be the best. So I started to play, and because I was, you know, I... I went through a period of mourning, of course, uh, a couple weeks. And during that time, I didn't want to do anything except practice my bass. Mm -hmm. And I called Maury Loudon and said, I want you to be my bass teacher. Would you teach me bass? And Maury said, well, what what do you want to learn? I said, teach me like I was 12 years old, just starting out. So he got some ammo and he started going through it. I mean, I really did practice until my fingers bled. Mm -hmm. And it was obsessive. (laughs) It was not the right thing for a 45-year-old man to be doing. It was the thing for a 12-year-old to do. And it was so, so difficult that I was looking up at the top of Everest (laughs) to even be able to play rhythm changes. I I was nowhere near that. Yeah. And then, coincidentally, about very shortly after, a year later maybe, I heard from a friend of mine, but also I should say in all of this, I knew nothing about jazz. Mm. I, was a, I was a record collector. I, of course, knew Sun Ra. I had the Miles Davis records you need to have. I had a jazz collection in my 20th century classical punk and rock collection thousands of records, I probably had 50 jazz records, and they would be the 50 that you would approve of. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, I said to you, what 50 jazz records should I have? It was exactly that list, <laughs> you know. And I've listened to them, and I was familiar with them, but many people have said, and I think accurately, that it's very hard to understand jazz without playing it, more sophisticated jazz. And I heard that this, by a series of weird glitches this fabulous one of the best jazz musicians happened to be playing a restaurant here in Vegas. So there's a magician named Mike Close who is also a piano player, jazz piano player. And he said, why don't we go have dinner and listen to this guy? And I met Jonesy and I was astonished by his skill. 
And we became friends very quickly and tying it all into this, forgive me, but fairly morbid thing. <laughs> both our mothers had died about the same time. Oh, wow. Which creates some sort of bond. Same thing with my, one of my best friends, Gilbert Gottfried. All, all of us lost our mothers around the same time. And all of us are mama's boys. And I got to be friendly with Jonesy. And we did that thing you're also not supposed to do as a grown up, which I went over his house and he played me records. Here's what, here's what Mingus does. Here's a, I told Buzz playing bass. And Jonesy, very kindly, would play a little music with me and I'd play bass and kind of stumble along. And then the other Vegas scene guys, Lon Bronson and Gary Hypes and those people, started coming over my house. They would jam with jazz and I would be allowed to play along. I wasn't really playing with them, but I'd play along. And then I said to Jonesy, you know, I think you should be touring as a jazz pianist. I think you should be a big star. But if you want, we can have you play an hour before the show while the audience is coming in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you should be doing that for a magic audience. I think you should be playing on your own. But if you want a steady paycheck, I will, I'll pay you. And I said, but the bad news is I'm going to play with you, <laughs> which means you'll be out there playing world-class jazz with an amateur bass player. <laughs> wow. And I'm sorry, but that's the only deal you're being offered. <laughs> I will play for 45 minutes with you, and the last 15 will be you alone. So the last 15, while I'm getting ready for the magic show, will be a chance for people to hear you really play, really hear how good you are. That's what most of the people are. But the 45 minutes before that, you're going to suffer. Mm -hmm. That simple. But I went to tell her, and said maybe we could have live jazz before the show. Mm. And Teller said to me, you know, a CD costs 15 bucks. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but Sinatra had live pre-show. Yeah. The only one you who know, had live pre-show. Very rare and completely gone in Vegas. Who wants live pre-show? You can do video. You can, nothing costs you anything. Mm -hmm. And both take on a full-time employee and a grand piano and all of that. It was stupid. It was stupid for Teller. It was stupid for Jonesy. But like a petulant child, I got my way. <laughs> and about 22 years ago, Jonesy started opening for us. And I went out every night and played an hour. Now, you know very well that whether you're talking chess or tennis or music, mm -hmm. playing with people a lot better than you. Makes you better. Makes you improve. Yeah. It's not good for the person playing with you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help them at all. But it helps you. Mm -hmm. So I went out there and after, uh, after two years, it wasn't embarrassing. <laughs> oh, wow. And remember, there's a big factor of it's a dog talking. It doesn't matter what the dog says, mm -hmm. right? I was a magician who was playing bass. The fact that I'm playing bass is the whole thing. <laughs> you don't expect the talking dog to be yelling. <laughs> the talking dog simply needs to talk. Yeah. And after, you know, first year, the dog was talking. By year two or three, the dog was using proper grammar. Yeah. You know. By year four, the dog was talking in tune. <laughs> you know, and all the stuff you'd expect, time and proof first, because I was a drummer and I've always had pretty good time. Mm -hmm. Intonation, because I've never had a good ear, was much slower. And the funny thing was I could hear the evolution in Jonesy's playing more than in my own. Wow. Because when we first started playing, Jonesy's left hand was very strong and on the beat and really guiding me. And as I would get better, Jonesy's playing would get more syncopated, more playing around the beat, more harmonically interesting. Mm -hmm. Left hand started doing 
more piano stuff, less bass stuff. Indeed. And by about 15 years, I, and I'll, I, I'm choosing my wording carefully, mm -hmm. I was better than I ever thought I'd be. <laughs> that does not mean good. That means better than I ever thought I'd be. And then at one point, you know, Jonesy never talked about my playing very much. He would, he would just play. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I wanted. I've always been so tremendously verbal. My whole life was words. The fact that Jonesy, from the very beginning, didn't really say anything to me in terms of direction. Mm -hmm. He didn't say work on your time more. He didn't say you have to try to stretch out. He didn't say any of those things you'd expect. He just talked to me with the piano. Mm -hmm. You know, when he would bang that left hand, I knew I was out of time. Yeah. <laughs> about, about the only thing he said verbally was very early on when he counted off. And I'd come in and say, or we could do that tempo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and slowly the tunes got more complicated. Mm -hmm. Slowly my solos got longer. It's really, in a certain sense, the perfect way to teach someone, right? You mm -hmm. know, they'll say of some of the soul players that they couldn't even play if the other people weren't in the room. Mm -hmm. It was... You just play. Yeah. So I became this guy who could play with Jonesy. You know. So the kind of music he played was the kind of music I played. And he would say certain stuff like, listen to Ray Brown. Hmm. Listen listen to more Ray Brown. And uh, it was great. After I'd been playing about 10 years, I went to uh, a Blue Note in New York and Ray Brown was playing. Oh, wow. And his sax player recognized me. And said to me during one of the breaks, he said, I'm a big fan, blah, blah, blah. He said, do you want to meet Ray? <laughs> and I said, well, well yes. <laughs> so I went backstage at the Blue Note. And I said, hi, I'm Pat. And Ray said to me, you're a very heavy cat, right? Very <laughs> heavy cat. <laughs> and he said, what do you play? You play like classical, like bluegrass or something. I said, yeah. no, I, I'm actually a uh, magician. <laughs> plays bass on the side. Yeah. He said, don't matter what you do, I was told you're a very heavy cat, that's all I need to know. Nice. So I said to Jonesy, on every record we do, Pendula, a very heavy cat, <laughs> Ray Brown. <laughs> but about four years ago, mm -hmm. Jonesy said to me, you know, you can gig anywhere you want now. Yeah, you you can you can go anywhere, and you can play bass. And he said, "So if you ever want to lop three zeros off your income, <laughs> you could be a full time jazz bass player." Yeah. And then he said, "Whatever it was about a year ago, he said we want to do a record with Jeff Hamilton." And I'd seen Jeff Hamilton play. And Jeff Hamilton was, of all the people I've seen, one of the finest musicians I've ever seen in any form. Jeff Hamilton killed me. And I said to I said to Jonesy, you know, you're a friend of mine, and we have this understanding, mm -hmm. but bringing in Jeff Hamilton, I just don't think I deserve to be in the room. Oh. And Jonesy said, well, Jeff has come to the show. I said, I know. I met him after the show. We talked. And he said, He's, he thinks your bass playing is good. And I said, well, no, he doesn't. <laughs> he said, well, yeah, he does. And I, uh, I said, oh. Uh. So Jeff said, no, I, I really, I really want to play with you. I said, well, you know, you're... You're rapping with a talking dog. Yeah. You're not really at the... Damn. And I mean, we went in the theater in the afternoon and set up my drum kit because I played behind Teller in one thing. So we set up my drum kit, piano, bass. I don't know. Well, I have been more terrified. 
<laughs> a couple years ago, three years ago, Jonesy had a gig at the Green Bell mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm. And for two songs, his bass player stepped out and I stepped in. Oh, nice. And I mean, I played for 15,000 people in Magic. I've done Saturday Night Live, I've done Letterman, I've done Stern for hours and hours and hours. I was like that. Oh. And I went on stage and said, I may vomit. That's not a joke. Oh no! I, I've never been sicker and more scared. Mm. It was. It was. The people that were with me were going. That was so cute. <laughs> you see, you followed it, but I said it was just so hard. <laughs> and I played okay. I did okay. So the same thing with Jeff Hamilton. Just the three of us in a room, and I was like this. And Jeff Hamilton said at the end, "That's fine. We can do that." And I went ah. So went in to record it. And Jonesy told me, he said, the thing that's going to surprise you is it's going to be easier because <laughs> you've got Jeff Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So all your time problems go away. And he said, most of the interest problems go away. It will be interesting every instant because Jeff Hamilton's play. Yeah. So you just sit there. And we did the whole record and probably... You know, as jazz should be done, in two or three takes of each two. And Jeff would listen back carefully. And I, I, I have to make this very clear. I'm not showing more respect to Jeff than to Jonesy. But Jonesy's one of my best friends. We sure. fuck around and we go out and stuff like that. So the, the armor goes down in front of Jonesy. Mm -hmm. But with Jeff, mm -hmm. way up to... Full. And we went into play, and you know, Jeff said afterwards, "That's good." Yeah. You know, there wasn't there wasn't over praise. There wasn't anything. It was just like that's good. And I was like, "Wow." Yeah. Jeff did not at any time stand up at the drums and say, "What the fuck are we doing? I'm getting out of here." <laughs> you know, your two goals in music is first to be no, first not to be noticed, mm -hmm. then to be noticed. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and I think on this record, if I were trying to be honest with myself, I think you would think the bass player is okay and Jeff and Jonesy are fabulous. And that's all I want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's the story. Well, you probably don't have a question left after that. I covered everything. I no, that that is that is very thorough, and I, and I think that it's, it's really important. There's multiple things, of course. As we age, it's always important in the use it or lose it. If you're not continuing to keep your stimulating your neural pathways, so yeah. learning languages, learning new words, learning to play music, but it always comes with the expectation that you it's not going to be the same as if you started when you were. 12 mm -hmm. or when you started or when you were four. I remember when I was in college, I had to take a phys ed class and I strangely enough chose gymnastics. And the first thing the guy said when we walked in, because we're all college kids, none of you are going to be gymnasts. Have that realistic expectation because Sorry. you needed to have started this like eight years ago and you'd be way more advanced than you are. So our goal is that you don't kill yourself in the process and it accounts as your phys ed credits and you're good to go. But the key thing with it is it doesn't mean, I suppose if I would have really decided to stick with it from them, I might have gotten up to a point of okay, but I would have never been a virtuoso. But as as we age, uh, okay becomes very important. Absolutely. And, psych and psychologically, setting your goal at okay is a huge level of maturity. Mm -hmm. I don't believe a 17-year-old can decide to be okay at something. Absolutely. But a 45-year-old can. Well, and I think that's the reason that a lot of 17-year-olds and younger people will start out doing something, maybe reach okay and go, well, if I'm not going to be the best, I'm not going right. to do this anymore. And they put yeah. it down and move on to try to find the next best thing. But especially with the relationship. And again, I thought it was so interesting because in the first record, you and Jonesy, I mean, it, 
it, it, it, the, the intricate relationship is there. However, piano technically is also a percussive instrument. So you've got mm -hmm. kind of two and basses as well. You've got your melodic and your percussive elements. And then when you add in that drum element, now you've got kind of your three combined percussives, but with the options of adding in all the melodic yeah. runs and stuff. And that's, it's, it is the perfect, well, it's the way a three-legged stool is extraordinarily stable. You have an, an incredible stability in that platform. Yeah, it was, it was, it was wonderful. And also, as I said, one of the hardest parts of playing with Jeff is when trading fours and doing his solos, I would be so astonished as an audience member. And I'd forget, oh, I gotta come in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's been playing. Now it's my turn. I was just lost in this Jeff Hamilton world. The level of musicianship in Jonesy and Jeff are, you know, and they both started at four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's not, that's not 40 years advantage. Mm -hmm. That's more than 40 years advantage. Indeed. Starting at four, you know. Well, and I think it's also advantageous, and it's another great thing that you're able to do, is the preservation of jazz as a music form, because unfortunately, as music is evolving, it has gone so much more by the wayside, and the music form itself, I mean, when you look way back in the day, it was a music for the people. It was a danceable mm -hmm. music. It was something that anybody could enjoy, and it was popular. And then it started getting more esoteric and a little more complicated. And I think folks said, well... As Louis uh, Armstrong said, Chinese music. Exactly. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't get that anymore. I don't understand it. And it doesn't resonate with me. And this is where especially a lot of what you're playing resonates with me. Now, I wasn't around making you know, the disclaimer. I'm not that old that like the Gershwin tune from 27 is something I ever grew up with but it, they do these these tunes resonate with you and and you're absolutely right i believe it, it's one of the common points that those of us that play bass it's you feel it when you're playing it in the center of your chest and when you hear it when it's well done and mm -hmm. so i've had the great pleasure of being at one of the earth wind and fire shows and having verdine punch those lines from my sternum out my my spine and it was just like oh man i was like if you could be suspended in midair, that would be what would be holding you up. It's just that boom, 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 boom. But, but, yeah, my, and my taste in music runs more, more Sun Ra, more experimental, more crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was a really nice thing about Jonesy. You know, I came in late on jazz. Yeah. I was born into the experimental before I was in the basics. It was really nice to go back and learn a little bit of that. Nice. Well, Ian, are you still playing on your K-Bass? No, 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 no. <laughs> I replaced my K-Bass. I'm going to have to pull up a, a file here to get all the stuff right. I, first of all, I played on a, uh, on a Domenico, Tomasini Domenico okay. from 1936. Nice. was a bass that Maury found for me that I played for 20 years. That was really nice. And then oh, this guy, this friend of mine, who plays with, uh, plays with Jeff Goldblum, Alex, Alex Frank, it's that easy. Mm -hmm. Alex Frank, who's a young bass player, and is very, very good. He had been coming to the show for years because he was a friend with Josie. And he came back one night after the show, and this was not long ago, Two years ago? Yeah, two years ago. He came back after the show and Alex said to me, he might have said it was Josie first without me in the room, but then said, Ben is finally out playing his bass. He's a better bass player than the bass he's playing. And I said to Jonesy, what does that mean? And he said, well, he was happy with the way you sounded on your bass before, but now you're better, you need a better bass. Yeah. And I said to Alex, you know, that was a bass I paid, you know, four or five grand for that Maury found for me. And it sounded nice. And uh, Alex said, but you're, you're better than that now. You're just better than that bass. And I said, listen, Alex, I know that many people who play music, mm. I said, I used to sit with Lou Reed 
we would talk about tubes <laughs> for hours <laughs> and his amp and the exact guitar. We would just talk about that. And I know from my musician friends that gear is an obsession. And oh. they love shopping. They love shopping. Oh. I said, I don't shop for anything. Other people buy my clothes. Other people buy everything. I hate going to stores. I don't even like going to music stores. I said, here's the deal, Alex. It's a bad deal. If you find me a base, I'll buy it. And I said, but I don't want to shop. And I won't even try it out. Mm-hmm. It'll all be you. So we found out the exact, uh, you know, where the F was in my base and the string length and all of that. And then Alex went shopping in L.A. And Alex found me five bases. Wow. And he sent me a video of him playing them. And I said, yeah, but you're better than me, so that doesn't tell me much. And then Alex said, I found this one bass that's way, way, way out of the price range that you told me. Uh Uh-oh. He said, it's really, really expensive. He said, and it's the best bass I've ever touched. Wow. And it's the best sounding bass I've ever heard. And I know you don't want to buy it, but I wanted to play it for you. And it was pricey. And I, uh, I wrote to Teller. This is all you need to know about Teller. <laughs> I wrote to Teller and said, you know, the way our tax system is just set up, Teller's buying half this base. Yeah. Because it's, it's being played only at the show. Because uh, I have a base I play at home. And I said, this is how much it is. And Teller wrote back, buy it today. We do not scrimp on our tools. We do not scrimp on our tools. Wow. Uh, and it's true. We paid, you know, $300,000 to make a little sawing and half ring work, you know. We don't scrimp on our tools. So I said, I want Jonesy to hear it. And Jonesy heard it and said, holy shit. (laughs) And I I talked to Gary Carr, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I played a duet with on bass, Gary Carr. I was also scared then. (laughs) Um, (laughs) He gave you a simple part to read and play. He played brilliantly over it. And Gary said, yeah, buy a good bass. You'll feel good about it. Yeah. So I, I bought it, and Alex brought it in, and I expected it to sound better. I didn't expect it to sound like a different thing. Hmm. And also, the second I touched it, I just played better. I'm going to flip screens again. The bass I bought was... Paul Tenegas, you know Paul Tenegas, mm-hmm. uh, L.A. Uh, Luthier, made it in 1948, and it was owned by Dave Stone. Oh, wow. So you know that name. And the really funny thing was, <laughs> it's Dave Stone's face, and because, you know, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, and right afterwards his face went on sale. And when I first played with Jeff Hamilton, I took the bass, he knew nothing about it, took the bass, set it up, hit an open E, and uh, Jeff went, oh, I played with that bass before. Wow. That's uh, that's Stoney's bass, right? (laughs) And I said, yeah, he said, I recognize the wear on the side, and also it has that tone, I remember. Wow. I went, oh, you, you, you played with this bass before. And I also put a thing out on Twitter or something, just that I, I bought the bass and talked about it a bit on my podcast. I got a wonderful message from Dave uh, Stone's daughter. Oh, nice. Who said, I'm glad you have it. And I said, well, you know I'll never do it justice, <laughs> but it means a lot that you're glad I have it. So that's the bass I have. And then at home, I have the weirdest thing in the world. <laughs> 20 years ago? Wow. I found out this company called Quintus, it was 2003, Quintus was making carbon fiber bases. Mm. 
And they're expensive, <laughs> but I thought, they'll make me a pink one that's <laughs> pink all the way through. So I called Quintus and I said, I want a pink upright. And they said, uh, you'll have to pay for it in advance because we made a fire red cello for someone and they didn't want it. Now we can't sell it. Oh. I said, sure, I'll pay in advance. I'm not going to back out. So I have a pink base about the color of the wall behind me. And it's carbon fiber and sounds tremendous. Wow. Really tremendous. I mean, not as good as the uh, stone base, mm -hmm. of course, but really good. And I play that at home when I play. And I... Uh, I play the, uh, the 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 Dan Stone bass uh, at uh, the show, the Dave Stone, I'm sorry, nice. Dave Stone bass at the show, and it gets uh, set up by uh, really Alex Frank uh, comes into town and checks to make sure my strings are fine, and I will say with a maybe a mixture, maybe this is a uh, a dumb brag, as they say, with a mixture of embarrassment and and pride. I show up, walk on stage, and the bass is all tuned and set up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. And the bass sounds fabulous in the room. Our sound man mics it. There's no pickup on it. Mics it. And it sounds so good in the room. When I got the new bass, our sound guy went flip city. He went, Jesus! <laughs> it's a 1,500 seat room and I hardly have to mic it. That motherfucker is loud. <laughs> and that's the other thing, you know, a really good bass, you forget they're really goddamn loud. Yeah. I mean, I probably play with the grand piano in 1,500 seats without an amp. And everybody could I hear mean, it. <laughs> yeah, but not well, you know, so we have that. Nice. And any of the other questions, like what kind of mic it is, you know, the floor yeah. mic and what kind of strings I use, you'd have to talk to our sound man and Alex Frank. But I also, I have one other bass. I read an article, once again, 20 years ago, about a time when they played aluminum basses. Mm. And I heard, uh, I heard a little bit of someone playing an aluminum bass like a national guitar, only a bass. And I asked a friend of mine, I wonder how you get one of those, and he dug around on eBay <laughs> and found one for a couple grand, and I bought it. And I played it rarely. It was jumped up, piece of shit. And then, although, yeah, Bob Dylan's bass player wanted to play with it a little bit and used it on some stuff, but it wasn't set up right. And then Alex Frank was over my house. Actually, he was playing my pink bass with Jonesy playing piano. We have a grand piano here. He was playing for a while. And I said, let me show you something. And I showed him the aluminum bass, and he went out of his mind excited. <laughs> and I said, listen, Alex, take it home. Take it to L.A. I said, it's, 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 it's alone for a long time. Yeah. And Alex cleaned it up and worked on it and put new strings and shaved the neck mm -hmm. and adjusted it and just it became his hobby for weeks. And then he sent me a video going, here's your aluminum base. And I was like, fuck, I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> but he's using it. He plays it now and again. Nice. He wants a certain sound. Uh, there was a young man who was a friend of mine, friend of friend of mine's uh, son, I guess he was 14 or 15, and he took up bass in his high school. And uh, I said to my friend, well, he can have my K bass, and he yeah. can use that. It's not a bad bass. So he played my K bass, went on to become a composition major. Wow. Went all, went all through music school, uh, I guess it was a minor, I think his major was math, but played, played composition, everything else, playing that K bass for years and years and years. And then three years ago, 
I called him up, he's whatever he is now, in the mid-twenties, and I said, time for you to step up from the K base, <laughs> now you get my base. Oh, wow. So that base moved to him, So he's and the K came back to me. <laughs> so now I've got the K, the fiberglass base, in my home, I have the stone base at the theater, and the aluminum base is on sabbatical at Alex Frank's house. If you haven't heard Alex Frank play, he has a trio. You just look up Alex Frank on on, uh, on Apple Music. I forget even the name of the trio, but Alex Frank will give you everything. It'll destroy you. Wow. Well, He's a real monster bass player. I always believe that these instruments, again, especially with the uprights, and it may be true for some of the newer electrics, but it's like all that time that you have spent with them and that kind of bond with I got woo woo your spirit with the instrument yeah. that sometimes it may be the only explanation why some of these instruments sound the way they do because in the fabrication approach they go they could have all been made all at the same time but when it was like this person's sound and their horn and their spirits in it it just seems to ha elevate well it it may even, you may not even need the supernatural. Yeah. I mean, uh, Tonegi, Tonegis, I never forgot his name, he made 60 bases in his life. Wow. Right? And Dave Stone, with his incredible ear, went and bought one. <laughs> so it's been chosen yes, yes. already. And then it was cared for and played perfectly for all those years. And mm -hmm. then Alex Frank, is listening to every fucking bass in L.A. you can find because I can't believe what a friend he is to do all that work. No. Now, some people love that work. Mm -hmm. Me, it would be the most hateful thing in the world. i got to play another bass. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I think he may have enjoyed it, but it was still a lot of work he did for me. And he found this bass. So you don't even need the supernatural. It has two sets of ears. Sure plus the person that made it, that are astonishing that it, you can do evolution. Yeah. That it's been winnowed down the, um, the, the field to a really great pace. Yeah. So I don't know if I deserve <laughs> Dave Stone's bass, and I don't know if I deserve <laughs> to be in a room with Jeff Hamilton and Mike Jones, but I've gotten away with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I guess the question and is... Andy Warhol said... Art is whatever you can get away with. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so what is in the future? I know, are, are you guys planning on recording more albums? Certainly still opening for your show? Yeah, you know, every night I play, you know, it's a lie to say I play an hour. It's probably 40 minutes. Every night I play 40 minutes with Jonesy. And the sign says a Mike Jones duo. Mm -hmm. does not say Pendulette. Although I am distinctive in the way I look, I'm not in the drag that I wear for Penn & Teller. I'm in a different coat and stuff, and I'm wearing a hat. And the lighting puts all the emphasis on, the on Josie. And I'm not unlit, but I'm not the primary, I'm not the star. Mm -hmm. And clearly in the way it's done, Jonesy is the star. And I take my solos and do such. And it's really strange because I'm in front of the audience and kind of being ignored before I'm going to come on as one of the stars of the show. And I get to look out at the audience. I get to watch them check in their phones, especially during the bass solos. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know. Because that's, that's why we give them bass solos, so they have a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. And I get to look out at the theater and be on the stage, and it's a very different experience than, you know, being one of the two stars of a magic show, where I'm loud and aggressive and, you know, everything's on me, you know, 50,000 watts of power. Wow. And I wouldn't stop it for the world. It's just... I never prepared before shows because I'm carny trash. So there was, you know, I, I was, you know, working fairs doing 20 shows a day. You don't prepare. Yeah. So uh, I've always prided myself that no meditation, no warm up, just walk on the stage, do the fucking show. Yeah. But now I gotta say, 
that hour before the show has made me uh, better in the real show. Nice. And of course, any music you learn automatically helps comedy. You know, timing. You could talk to anybody about that. Sure, you just tell those grooves are so much deeper than music and so much deeper than speaking. Mm -hmm. They're just grooves of our heart. And once you get that, you know, Conan O'Brien said he didn't understand how anybody could do comedy who didn't play an instrument. You know, Conan plays guitar. Mm. You know, when you've got people like Lenny Bruce, who didn't play, but was obsessed with jazz. And you got Johnny Carson, who was a drummer. And Bill Cosby, who we won't talk about, but also a drummer and a fairly good one. And you've got, uh, you've got all that from people who were, were really able to speak well, you know. Nice. So it's been good. Well, it's very exciting for you to have shared a, this journey. The records, I hardly recommend them. And certainly, I think it would be worth, I'd love to hear you guys play live whenever there's an we're opportunity. Doing a, uh, we're doing a record release party where it'll be Jeff Hamilton, me and Jonesy in Vegas. I think it's early October or something, but you can find out. Nice. And also, yeah. have by the show, see our magic show and make sure you arrive at eight, not nine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for pleasure, people... Pleasure talking to you. For people that don't know, if they want to know more about this, they should go to penandteller.com, be the best place. Anything will lead you there. Okay. Everyone knows how to use the internet. You'll get there. Absolutely. Well, Penn, we appreciate you taking your time. Folks, you've seen him here on Bass Musician Magazine, Penn Gillette. Nice talking with you, man.